All right, good morning, everyone. Turn one more time to the person next to you and say, it is good to see you. Good. <laughs> All right, let's read the passage today. Um, not exactly one of those amen passages, but uh, nonetheless, it is the word of God, and we're going uh, in Jesus' first sermon, and he's going over expounding uh, the proper function of the law, and um, now we're here on the topic of divorce. Okay, so uh, let's read this passage together in one voice, if it's there. Let's read it together. Ready, go. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Amen. <laughs> uh, it's very important as we look at any piece of scripture, and, and I, I also, um, you know, I have to pray and really ask for God's wisdom because you can't take just one part of scripture um, you need to be able to uh, carefully see each part of Scripture as it fits in the whole picture. And so let me just go back just a little bit, just to remind you guys of what ha was happening here. So Jesus now is addressing a part of Mosaic law concerning divorce. In the Old Testament, uh, there were multiple, uh, many men had multiple wives. Uh, would not recommend that. Uh, and obviously, there were a lot of problems, if you can imagine. One man, two, three, four wives. It's not a recipe for harmony, uh, as you can see in, in the scripture. And they've come to Moses and say, I'm having problems, Moses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what do I do? And Moses would gave in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, he would give a, you know, a way out, so to speak. This is a way out. You give a certificate, uh, and, and you can uh, send her away. And now Jesus is addressing this issue as he's addressed, as we went through the Ten Commandments, parts, uh, portions of the Ten Commandments, Addressing the law and helping the listeners reevaluate what that law means and the point and purpose of it. So many people thought just because I don't I don't commit adultery uh, with my hands or that was last week I don't commit adultery with my eyes or my hands or my actions. Jesus says, well, if you even look at someone with lust, you've committed adultery already in your heart. Or just because I haven't murdered someone physically, Jesus expounds that and says, well, if you, have you called somebody a fool ever? How many of us have called somebody a fool? We have probably multiple times per day. Someone cuts you off and you say, you fool, but you don't say you fool. You probably say something else. But even then it says you're guilty of the, and, and, and you will see the, the hell of fire, judgment. And the whole point that Jesus is expounding in this first sermon, recorded sermon, is he's trying to get the listeners to understand the law is not something you keep to be righteous before God or before men. That's not the point, and that's what they were doing. The Pharisees would walk around, look at me, so holy. I don't murder, I don't commit adultery. Those are those guys over there. I'm not. Look at my clothes, look at my house, look at all the things that I have because I love God, and I serve God, and I follow God. There's nothing wrong with having that heart to want to serve God and love God. Nothing wrong with it. But the way that they use that law or use that obedience to God to hold it over others was what Jesus was trying to destroy. And to show everybody there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one holy. No one can keep it. Perfectly. And that's where the, that's where the, 
good news of the gospel comes in, and that's what we that's why we look to Jesus, and that's why we believe in him, because he comes, and in Matthew chapter 5, before we he expounds into the Ten Commandments, he says, I've come here to fulfill this law. That's incredible. The law that judges us because we're guilty under it, all of us, Jesus comes and says, I'm going to fulfill it. To the iota. To the dot. And the listeners don't understand what he's saying. They're like, what are you talking about? Fulfill it. What do you mean, fulfill it? What do you mean? It's ours to fulfill. It's ours to keep. What are you going to do? I mean, okay, I guess. You keep it as we do. No, no, no. And he says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you will never, certainly not, ever enter the kingdom of heaven. That, is, that statement right there should tell you where he's going. No one gets in by keeping the law. No one. You got to surpass that of the Pharisees. Remember, the Pharisees thought that they kept it so perfectly that they earned the right to get in, right? As Paul, before Paul, Saul would state, according to the law, I'm perfect. I've earned it. That's how they thought, walking around. And Jesus is like, no, your, your righteousness has to surpass those guys, those guys that are perfect in their eyes. That's the only way. And he starts this sermon with the Beatitudes. And I'm just going to go back there briefly because it gets to the core and heart of what God wants for you and for me. Okay. And he starts with, blessed are what? Blessed are the rich. That's great. Yes, blessed are the, hashtag blessed. Look at me, I'm rich. Hello. There's nothing wrong with being rich, by the way, or the kingdom. Amen? No, man? Yes. But he says, blessed are poor. In other words, blessed are those who know, who beg, who understand that they need the spirit. That's a blessing. The world will tell you, no, you don't need God. You don't need anything. You just need Get up on your horse, strap on, and do this. Come on, kick it in gear. Nothing wrong with that either. Better than being not doing nothing and being lazy and getting couch potato. There's nothing wrong with those motivational messages of you gotta, what's the first thing you gotta do when you wake up? Make your bed. You ever heard that one, that video? Make your bed. And that, I, that's, I try to teach my kids to do that, and I, I'm, I'm also guilty of that too. And, you know, you gotta start some, your day off with a success or an achievement. Hallelujah. Amen. but that's not what Jesus said. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who realize, I need the spirit of God. I need you, God. Blessed is that person. Not blessed are those who have this or who have that, who have a perfect this or perfect that or have this in their garage or that in their bank account or this, this. No, no, no. Blessed are those who even, although they have that or not, plead for and realize they need the Spirit of God. Because that's how we're created to be as Christians. You eat a good piece of steak, a good piece of the cow, it'll taste good going down, but it goes out the same. And then you got to get another piece of that steak. We are created as physical beings to enjoy those parts of creation and food and all that things as well. But the essence of us, how God created fish to live in the water, human beings, humankind were created to have intimate connection with their creator. Blessed is the man and woman who realizes their need for that. Daily. Blessed are those, not who are happy and all the time. Blessed are those who what? Mourn. Mourn over what? What do you mourn over? Oh, man, my, my boss is, or, oh, man, this person who's talking smack about me at school, or, oh, man, you know, what is it that troubles your heart? 
Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn over the right reasons. Do you mourn over your sin? Do you mourn over why Jesus had to take the cross? Why does he have to do that? Why is that necessary? I'm not saying feel bad for Jesus. You don't need to feel bad for Jesus. He's not dead. Amen? He went through some horrific pain, but not just the pain of he had to go through separ- becoming sin. Okay? Can you, we can't even imagine that. God becoming sin, separated from God, being judged in our place. The God of creation. Do you mourn over the cost? Because blessed is the man who does. Yeah, but we're so self-righteous. I'll be the first in line to tell you that. So self-righteous. You know, no, no. Blessed are those who mourn. Not who are sad, who mourn. mourn. Mourning happens after a great loss. Because if you mourn correctly, you will be comfortable to know that that's the price that was paid in full. Amen? Blessed is that man. And he starts off that beatitude and presents the gospel. I'm here to fulfill it, guys. He's letting them know. The righteous requirements of the law that condemns all of us because we're lawbreakers, we're sinners. I'm here not to remove it, not to abolish it, but to fulfill it. To pay the penalty of sin, fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. The law is a good thing. It directs us to the standard of God. It directs us and shows us we can't get to that standard perfectly. And it points us to the only one, the only holy righteous one who can, who said he would, and he did. He did. He did. So that's why you don't owe anything to God. You can't pay it. That's why the gospel is so good. That's what separates the gospel and religion. But many believers go to church living religiously, and they walk away from church jaded. Because that's how they think it works. That God has, has a paper and he has a tally sheet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly how I lived for so long and I still got scars from it. I thought that if I did something good, God would bless me. If I did something bad, he would take even the blessings that I had. I did not understand. But the gospel is God, as, as Mike shared as well, doesn't hold anything back. He doesn't give 80% and then holds back 20 and waits on your behavior. He poured himself out. 100% gave us himself, gave us everything. That's crazy love right there. And the law points us and shows us our need for Christ. And then if you believe that, Christ has paid it in full, that you can walk blameless, holy, righteous, made righteous through the blood of Jesus, his work, not yours. Not only will it, not only will it humble you, it'll give you freedom. Amen? True freedom. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And John 8, 32 and 36, if you have a Bible, you can look there with me. But the truth shall set you free. And if you have the Son, if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. What kind of freedom is that? Galatians chapter 5. This is a passage, and I do this from time to time, that I, I pray that you look over. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 through 26. What kind of freedom is that? It's not a freedom. It's not an opportunity for the flesh to do whatever it desires. That's not the freedom. That's a misunderstanding of freedom. But it's a freedom now to love God. 
We couldn't do that before. But if you understand what God has done for you on the cross, if you understand what Jesus has done for you, now you are free to love God. And you are free to love others. It wasn't possible before, but now it is. There's no way around it now. We have to address the passage, and we have to address address divorce. And it's not just it's not just divorced families or broken families that have scars that need healing. That's not only divorced families, all families. And that's kind of like, like my biggest, you know, I, I don't think I'm free of it yet, and I need to be, I think, but I always have this, um, you know, regret is, is time to time, I guess that's a good word to use, but I always feel like, I've given my kids scars and I don't want to give them any more. And those scars come from scars that I have. And let me try to explain. There are so many scars that, that we, we carry within our families because families are made up of people and people in this world are all broken whether they realize it or not. And those, your fa- your, you know, our parents and their parents and their parents, on and on and on, all have scars themselves. And unknowingly, they get passed down. And most of them are all misunderstandings. And let me give you an example. One of my biggest scars growing up in middle school and high school was that my dad and my mom were not like other dads and moms. What do I mean by that? So middle school, high school, early part of high school, most of my middle school I spent in a state called Kansas. Anybody know where Kansas is? (laughs) Yeah. In the Midwest, surrounded by non-Koreans, I was the only with two other Koreans at my high school who went to my church, uh, only three Koreans in a sea of non-Koreans. And sports was big in Kansas. Played football, basketball, tennis, baseball, love sports. I was I would go to sports and how to be doing sports. And uh, every time I looked to the sideline, I saw a sea of parents. It's like an American thing. I think culturally, support your kids. Like, yeah, 55, that's my son. <laughs> that's 55, that's my son, you know. And I remember in high school, uh, I was kind of quick. I was kind of fast on my feet, and I was a kickoff return. Kickoff return, you know the kickoff return? You guys familiar with football? I was a kickoff returner, and that season, I, re- I, I returned two kickoffs for touchdowns. And one of those times I crossed the finish line and without even me knowing it, I knew my parents weren't there, but without me knowing it, I turned so I could see my parents, so I could show them, man, I scored. Mom, oh, dad, oh, not there. And it was, I hit it very well. It's kind of silly. You guys might think, that's so silly. What are you talking about? But the reason why it was so, so scarring to me because everyone else's parents, and it wasn't everyone else, by the way, probably not. You know, not everyone's parents was on the sideline. But there was a lot of parents there. And I carried that scar with me until I got older and mature and was, was able to get out of my self, you know, you know self-loathing and self, me-centered thinking. It took, it took me time to realize that in my dad's position, my parents' position, They weren't doing that on purpose. As far as they're concerned, they were parent number one and, you know, the best parents in the world. Amen? And they were. It's not their fault. You see, 
I try to be at my kids' games now all the time because I have that scar, but my, my parents, my dad, they weren't scarred by not having their parents around for sports. Because when they grew up, my dad was born in 1945, the Korean War broke out in 1950. In 1953, the Korean was over. war was over. He was eight years old. There was no sports in 1953. Well, how did they grow up? They grew up fighting, grinding, working, crawling to do what? Get food on the table. There was no time. And then my father wasn't scarred by not having, you know, like the same scar that I had because all the dads were the same in Korea. Make sense? All the dads came home and, you know, this is the common thing. They wouldn't say like, hey, give them a hug or I love you. They're not very emotional in Korea, you know. They would just come home and say, did you eat? <coughs> Good. Have a nice day, <laughs> you know. And the reason that did you eat question, it's not just did you eat. The question is, the, 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 the checking is, Hey, I'm doing all I can to put food on the table. Did you get some of that? Do you understand? That's, that's, that's I love you in their language, in their way. But in high school, I was seeing a different way. My, my parents aren't American. They didn't grow up America. They didn't grow up in the greatest country of the world, blessed with that thing, you know, with sports and, <laughs> you know, Teenagers driving cars, and you know everyone's got a smartphone, and you know they didn't grow up like that. So having a roof over my head, having three square meals on the table, and providing for the clothes that I had, as far as they're concerned, they were the best parents in the world, and they were. It was just my misunderstanding. Does it make sense? Most scars that we carry are misunderstandings because we don't understand. We're so engrossed with our own thoughts. And that's why we need God to come in to shatter that so that we can see. And this, well, I, I'm bringing the, tying this all back to divorce. Divorce is an issue of misunderstanding, I believe. Non-communication. And not understanding, misunderstanding, not being able to apply God's word not being able to have Christ-centered marriage is the reason. The more and more I got into the gospel, and I'm still on that journey, the more I began to understand my parents, the more healing that I received and I understood. But statistically, it's crazy. There's one divorce every six seconds in this country, okay? That's 2,400 per day. It's rising. And you would think if they made a mistake one time, that second time, third time, it wouldn't it'd get better. But it gets worse. If you divorce once, you're 60% more likely above the national average mean, 60% above more to get divorced. If, if you get divorced twice, the likelihood you'll get divorced three times, it goes up to 73%. And you look at statistics in, the, in divorce in the church, and at first I was a little bit shocked, and then I read the, the fine print, but it's the same as the national average. But that's taken into account what's called nominal Christians. You know what nominal Christians are? Nominal Christians are Christians that go to church maybe once or twice a year. They profess being Christian, but they don't really understand what Christianity is all about. But the group of Christians that are followers of Christ, that go to church every Sunday, that put their life centered on the word of God, are 35% lower than the national average. And that's why it kind of balances out. Actually, the nominal Christians are 20% higher. That's kind of crazy than the national average. Isn't that crazy? And that's where they get the, you, can go, you go to church and you still get divorced. That's where that, that's, that comes from, that thought comes from. Because 20% of nom, uh, the nominal Christians are 20% higher and that's what happens when you don't have a firm understanding of the gospel and you throw law at each other. You pick at each other and you throw law because you're versed in it. 
thou shalt not commit adultery, and then boom, you did it, bam, divorce. And I'm going to get to what Jesus is saying, and that's not Jesus' point at all. Divorce is a grounds for, uh, adultery is the grounds for divorce. It's not a requirement for, you have to get divorced. But the effects of divorce, you don't have to say, it goes without saying, between husband and wife, it's broken. It extends to extended family, especially if it happens when, you're, when the kids are young. It affects the grandparents, right? Grandparents have to start taking care of kids. Extended family get, gets involved. Relationships, friendships that you had. Which side do you pick? If, you're, if you have common friends, what do you do? Like, Whose side do you take? I mean, it, it affects so many different things. It affects the children the most. 60% of girls that are from divorced parents, are six, are, are, um, girls are 60% more likely to get divorced themselves. And for boys, 35% more likely. There's a lot of bad news, I know, but let me get to the good stuff now, okay? The good news. But let's see what the biblical teaching on divorce is. So why is Jesus, when it says here in Matthew 5, 30, 31, he says, it was also said, it was also said, and remember, you have heard it said, he's repeating this, he's quoting Old Testament Mosaic law, just to tell them, well, this is what the law says that you have heard and you know, and then he says, well, this is what I'm going to tell you what it really is pointing to. But he says, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Where does that come from? Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1 through 4. Okay, don't take my word for it. If you go back there and look, it's Moses, again, telling, giving the people who are demanding a way out of their relationships, the way out. There's problems going on. Moses, Moses, we, this, is, this is a big problem. I'm having a problem with one of my wives. What do I do? What do I do? And then Moses says, okay, well, okay, well, this is, oh, this is if it is for this reason, and in, look there with me, if you see in your eyes any impurity or uncleanliness, you may divorce and give her a certificate and send her away. And there was a big debate at that time of how that verse is interpreted. There was two big major, major schools of thought. One thought was unclean in your eyes. That could be anything. That could be anything. You don't cook well. Send her away. No, that, I'm serious. That's how many of the scribes interpreted it. Anything the man saw was unclean or unfit, uh, he could just make that judgment. And there was this long actual list of things on one school of thought. And one school of thought was it's only adultery, sexual immorality. And Jesus is kind of saying, I agree with the latter part. It's not whatever you want and you can send them away. But good. But look, but look it's not the point, though. He just addresses it briefly here. But if you look, in Matthew 19, he takes more time. And please, if you have a Bible, turn there with me. Go to Matthew 19. If you look at Matthew 19, verse 3, it says, The Pharisees came to him and tested him by saying, here comes the test. Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? You see that school of thought? Any cause? So they're testing him. Trying to see which school of thought is right. Any cause in, in, front, in the eyes of the husband? Or what is it? And Jesus doesn't even address that. He gets back to the heart of it. And this is what his point is, guys. Verse 4, he says, he answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. 
What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. He doesn't even talk about divorce. What does he say? He talks about how it was originally intended, marriage was originally intended to be. This teacher of the law is coming testing well, which school of thought is right. And for any reason, or and look, he he addresses it and says, no, 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 but hey. He created, have you not read that he created them from the beginning, made them male and female? Therefore, a man shall leave the father, his mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He addresses how marriage was intended to be. Divorce was never the option or the original intention. Now it's crazy these days. People signing prenups are like, it's just like common, common, common thing to do. Just in case. We're getting married. I love you for till death do us part. But just in case it doesn't work out, I don't want you to take half of my stuff. And it's becoming more and more common. That's not the intention of marriage. It's not, hey, let's see how it goes. It's the two become one flesh. What God brings together, let man not separate. It's a very serious thing. And Jesus even mentions, if it's not, if it's a commission or calling you can bear, don't get married. If you can do it. Because marriage, it's supposed to be forever. And look at what he says in verse 7. The Pharisees then say, whoa, wait, 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 but did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? That's Deuteronomy 24. They're saying, yeah, yeah, but Moses said we could, we could, we could, you could, you give us a certificate if, if we don't, you know, you know, if there's some sexual immorality or unclean in our eyes. And then this is what Jesus says, it's astounding on what he says. Verse 8, he said to them, because of your hardness, of heart. Not God. It says, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Do you guys understand that? What he's saying? What Jesus is trying to tell them, direct them to? You guys are getting it wrong right now. Your hearts are hardened. You want to get divorced from your wives, that's not the intention. But he doesn't deviate from the law, and he says, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except, and he makes it clear, it's not divorce for whoever you want, whatever you want. Whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. But again, adultery is not an absolute requirement that you divorce. It's just the grounds for it. Does it make sense? It's the grounds for it. And right before this passage, Jesus in Matthew 5 explains that adultery is not just the commit, committing of that act of adultery. If you have lust for someone with your eyes, you've committed it. No one is innocent, in other words. Everyone is guilty. If we're going to get divorced before adultery, then everyone's got to get divorced. <laughs> you want to find a reason for divorce? You don't have to look far. But Jesus is saying, no, that's not the point. And we're getting here to the final point today. The biblical model of marriage that Jesus explains is himself and the church. What he did for you and me, what he did for the church on the cross, is that's the example, the model of how a husband and wife should be. Laying down your life for each other. Presenting each other holy and blameless through the washing of the blood of Jesus. The proper use of the law makes that very clear. No one is innocent. Everyone is guilty. We're all guilty of adultery. 
That's why we need a savior. That's why we need Jesus. That's why we need Christ. And it's interesting. Divorce, and I was reminded of this, and someone uh, put this thought into my mind. Divorce is trying to find a way out. We're all trying to do that, I think. We're all trying to find a way out, trying to find a way of escape, trying to find a way from God, whether we realize it or not. We're trying to find something else, and God is the opposite. He's not trying to find a way out of your life. He's trying to find a way in. He wants to break down the walls. He doesn't want division. He doesn't want separation. He wants unity. He wants to be the center of your own your heart and the center of every relationship, especially between man and wife. Use the law properly. It's not meant to judge us. It does judge us, but it's not, its purpose is not to judge us. It's to show us the holy standard of God, how perfect and holy he is. And it points us to the only one who could keep it perfectly. His name is Jesus. I bless you in Jesus' name that you look towards him. Find forgiveness for your own sins, and then in turn, find the, in your heart the forgive, to be able to forgive others. The commandment of God is to love God. It can't happen if you don't understand God's love for you first. Amen? And then it's to love one another. The last passage I want to refer to before I give you the conclusion is Ephesians 5, chapter 22, verse 33. Very, very famous passage. There's three or four verses, instructions on what the wife should do. But to the husband, there's eight verses. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself, gave himself up for her so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Verse 28, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Verse 31, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. The key to marriage is dying. That's the model given. Lay down your life. Men, men, that is your responsibility. That is my responsibility. That is our responsibility. And it's only possible as we put Christ at, at the center. You can't lay your life down unless you see the model the example of what laying life down looks like and is. Can't give love to someone if you're not experiencing it yourself. That's religion, to try to make something up from yourself. But the gospel is that God has done it for you, that God has shown you what love is. And as you experience that love and accept it, that's all he requires is that you really believe it and receive it. And as you receive that love and it's healing you and it's working in your heart, naturally, it will go out to others. So in conclusion, treat marriage as a sacred, appointed, God-appointed institution. If you're married already, go deeper into Christ. Let Christ be the center. 
communicate with each other, understand each other, forgive each other, love each other, lay down your life for one another. Loving your partner is loving yourself, as Jesus has said and as Paul writes in Ephesians. And if you're not married, pray and prepare yourself for marriage. It's not something to take lightly, in other words. It's something, it's something to look forward to. And let me tell you, it is one of the greatest tools, I think, that God, ways that God uses uh, marriage to sharpen each other, if that makes any sense. To heal each other. I received a lot of healing from my relationship with my wife. I'm an only child. I had no one to talk to. I had no siblings. I, I didn't know how to effectively have arguments. <laughs> Never had those before. You know, Arguments with parents are not really arguments. They're just like, they're not arguments at all. <laughs> it's just like, I say so. Okay. <laughs> you know? But to, you got to learn how to like effectively, you know, arguing is not necessarily bad. You grow from it. You learn from it. You know, you might not like it at the moment, but it rubs you a certain way where you, it, sh it sharpens you. It reveals things in you that you don't want to be revealed. And that's the beauty of not just mar a marital relationship, but relationships, with brothers and sisters in Christ that can, you know, help each other to see those weaknesses and strengths and help each other. But it's only possible with Christ at the center. So young people, don't jump into just relationships and treat it as just, I'm bored. Let me, let me find a girlfriend or boyfriend. It is a very, very sacred institution that God has ordained for you. Okay? Secondly, in conclusion, if you are from a broken home, remember that it's not just broken homes that need healing. All homes need healing, but if you have from a broken home, the healing process is what we need to start. Start understanding that everyone involved is fallen short of the glory of God, is a sinner in need of grace, in need of Christ. And pray for that healing. And last but not least, we need to teach and prepare our next generation of how important marriage is. More and more, it's common for broken homes to, to happen in every community. You know, it's not just marriage, get married to someone that you fall in love with and, oh, you know, have Christ at the center and let's have a happy marriage. That itself is not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is for missions. Many broken homes and communities need to see a model of what a Christ-centered marriage looks like. They need to be able to come into your home and see that, whoa, hey, something's the fragrance of Christ. Something's different about this home. Something's different about this couple. What's the secret? We need missionaries. That's a mission field. Broken homes throughout the world need homes that are restored, not perfect, but have to have Christ at the center. And we need to raise up our next generation to be that, be to be those missionaries. And we ourselves need to be those missionaries as well. I bless us in Jesus' name that we carry this covenant throughout the rest of this week and for the rest of our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord showing us the model of what marriage is to be through your sacrifice of laying down your life for us and paying the debt we could never pay on the cross. Father, I pray that we would immerse ourselves in that love. We would daily remind ourselves of the cross. And as we enjoy and confirm the blessing of salvation, given to us by your grace. Lord, help us to share that love, to share that forgiveness and uh, reconciliation power with others. 
especially to our uh, spouses, especially to our closest relationships and family, where it may be a week where we can receive much healing. And we can also place in our hearts the broken families and all the communities that we live in. Uh, give us your grace, Lord, to reach them. We thank you and pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen.